to you about uh, what we're looking at in terms of long-term strategy. There's so many things happening in terms of um, fuel economy standards, greenhouse gas. Uh, there's a lot going on, and a manufacturer like Mercedes-Benz always has to take the lead in something like that, and it's something that we're excited to be a part of. So, so much happening. Obviously, if we look forward to 2025, uh, Dietmar mentioned it, but the standard that we're looking forward to is 54 and a half miles per gallon. That's pretty stout. Um, if you think about where the standard is today at 30.2 miles per gallon, that's been that way since 2011, and that was not changed since 1990, where it was 27 and a half miles per gallon. So it's a pretty steep slope in terms of getting to that corporate average fuel economy. Number. Coinciding with that, not only do you have a greenhouse gas number, an EPA CAFE number, you also have the ZEV standard. So the ZEV standard, as you know, most of you who are either, now we're here in California, or much of, most of you are familiar with that, but that says also by 2025 that 15% of your portfolio has to be a zero emission vehicle. So it becomes an interesting contradiction sometimes. A lot of times the technology goes hand in hand, but many times the, the technology also may contradict itself. So it gets to be interesting because as a manufacturer, you end up being a slave to three masters in a way. Um, but it gets really tricky, but of course uh, we're excited about the challenge and, and what that could mean for us. So let's just talk about sort of the situation that we're in. Obviously, with uh, fuel prices where they are today, we're in a little bit situation maybe than we were five, six years ago. But we know that at some point, gasoline is a finite resource. We know that we have certain standards that we have to meet in terms of greenhouse gas, and there's only a few ways to get there. And obviously, those are with cars that get better fuel economy, emit uh, fewer uh, emissions, and so on and so on. We have to get there. So gasoline per year, this is some pretty staggering statistics. It's $1.3 billion spent on fuel per day. That comes out to about $2,000 a year for an average consumer. So obviously, these are pretty big numbers. We're higher just a few years ago, and we expect over time these will continue to go up. But one thing that we do know is in the past 50 years, if we think about the automotive industry as a whole, the changes that we've had are, you could say, significant, but compared to the next 50 years, pale in comparison to what's going on. So just think about in the last 50 years, and that's 1966. 50 years ago when I say it, it used to, be, used to sound like a long time, and now I'm like, ah, that's not, that's not as long ago as I thought. But uh, 1966, everybody's driving cars with carburetors and taking lighted gasoline, um, driving you know, big cars, sometimes with seat belts, sometimes not, uh, but not a lot of changes since that time. But over time, okay, unleaded fuel, that's something around the mid-70s, cars now, uh, and it, there's barely nothing on the road today that doesn't do just fine on unleaded. So leaded gasoline, that was one change. You think about fuel injection, something that we actually started many, many years ago, but now virtually every car on the road today uses fuel injection, direct injection, some form of direct injection. But again, from a customer perspective, not a huge change. You're not giving up a sacrifice. You're probably getting better throttle response, fuel economy, more power. Those are all things that are easy for the customer. From a safety perspective, we've had obviously seat belts, airbags, side airbags, knee bags, pelvis bags, everywhere you can put an airbag, but again, all things that support the customer. So these are things that if you think about in 50 years, we've come a long way, but not really asking the customer to make a big change. You're actually just getting more for your money, more performance, and better safety. So all great things. The next 50 years though, we're looking at some very, very dramatic changes. 2066, it's a long way out, but the next 50 years you'll see more, and I would say in the next 10 to 15 years you're going to see some unbelievable changes. We're already seeing a lot of things happening with engines, and the technology is awesome. And from everything we see so far, it really just, especially if you're an enthusiast, it's just better. Um, so it's really some amazing things, but if you think about what engines have done in the last few years, You've seen downsizing, but very little sacrificing in terms of power. You've seen direct injection. So direct injection sort of coming on top of fuel injection. Most every car on the road today uses what we call homogenous fuel injection, which that's just an intake charge which comes with the intake stroke in the engine. We'll further develop this even further to what we call stratified injection. Gives you the ability to save even more fuel and uh, it puts out a little more emissions, but we'll be able to control that for the sake of having better fuel economy. Turbocharging, e-turbocharging, 48 volt electrical systems, all things done that will improve the performance of the car, but ultimately will also help with emissions. And then, uh, so you really are, we're going a long way 
in terms of just taking the, the uh, direct injection and taking the technology within a conventional powertrain to its absolute limit. So we have some great things coming in that realm. And uh, even later this year, we expect to launch our first stratified direct injection engine, which uh, we're looking forward to what that brings to the road in terms of fuel economy and also still giving that same customer experience, great power, all those things that they're expecting. Now the next up, obviously autonomy. It's, a, it's everyone's favorite topic. It's something we've talked a lot about, obviously with the E-Class, but from an autonomy perspective, this is something that Mercedes-Benz has been working on for many, many years, launching the first car using radar back in 1998, the S-Class 98, 99 timeframe here in the US. We've developed that even further, but what that also means just to the infrastructure and what autonomy can do in terms of helping with traffic, helping uh, accident-free driving, that's our long-term goal, and that's one of the things that we see as a huge contributor there. Next up, vehicle size. You think about just what's happening in vehicle size. Now, we've seen this go a couple of different ways. Things are starting to grow again, and it follows very closely with what's going on with fuel economy. But what we do expect over time, that vehicle size will be impacted by what the fuel economy standards are. And the question is, are customers going to accept it? There's something very interesting in the US, which makes it unique from virtually every other market in the world. In the US, the manufacturer, the onus of fuel economy is on the manufacturer, which that's a very unique proposition when you compare that to what goes on in Europe. What goes on in Europe is the customer is responsible for fuel economy. They are penalized if they want to buy a big engine. It costs a, a hell of a lot more, not just what the engine costs. You'll pay in taxes. So a very different proposition of what goes on in the US versus what's happening in Europe. So that's something that all of the manufacturers, it's certainly not one issue just for Mercedes-Benz, but every manufacturer in America will have to work within that realm of understanding we've got a certain standard to meet, but we've also got to get customers to buy these cars. So very interesting things. We're kind of wondering how that might develop even ourselves, just because there, currently there's a big divide between what customers are looking for and, and what, the, what the fuel economy uh, regulations say you've got to get to. So definitely some uh, impacts on there. But what we do see is that consumers, in terms of acceptance of fuel economy and, and uh, the technology to get there, we see that acceptance growing quite a bit. So that's one of the things that we see. The, the, the winds of change are blowing in the directions where people, young people especially, millennials, Gen Y, even people Gen X, the boring ones like me, Gen X, um, we are also accepting of this technology because we've had the experience with it. It's just like anything else. Once you've had the experience with it, you've grown up with it, you're comfortable with it, it's not something you're afraid of. You hear start-stop technology, you hear all these things coming downsizing, you're not immediately thinking, oh, that's bad, oh, that's bad, and that's bad. No, actually, they're pretty impressive technologies that actually enhance the driving experience while reducing fuel, uh, impacting fuel economy in a positive way. So what we've seen with these younger folks, we see this just how this changes year by year. In 2014, about half those that were polled were willing to pay more for those companies that did uh, a better impact in terms of social and positive environmentally. Year over year, that change has gone up dramatically. We've gone from more than half to nearly three quarters. So we see that building with millennial generations, Gen Y, Gen X, all folks that we see that as they're seeing this technology take shape, they're more willing to, to be uh, embracing of it. So really a neat thing to do it. An important thing for Mercedes-Benz and Daimler as a whole is to, when you think about technology to advance what we're doing in terms of pushing fuel economy to the limit, we know that our job is really creating core competencies in all of these. Because you don't want to pick one. You really can't pick one way of doing something. It's not always diesel. It's not always hybrids. It's not always fuel cells. You have to have a core competency in every one of them because each one of them has an ideal application based on what type of transportation you might need. So we want to be there in that space creating and being a part of that development. And that's something that we've done very well throughout the years and will continue in that space. One of those that you hear a lot about and something that we've been involved with for a long time, we'll talk just about a few of them, obviously hydrogen fuel cells. Many people see this as the long, long, long-term future. It's, uh, it's something that everyone is really embracing, loves the technology, but obviously it has its limits. There's fuel infrastructure. Infrastructure is always a tough one to overcome because we've developed the infrastructure we've had over 100 years. So you think about, we have fuel stations everywhere. That wasn't something that happened overnight. Infrastructure, though, was a problem when the first gasoline car was developed. 
So it's not something that's new to anyone, but it's just something that takes time. And now that we've got one infrastructure, how hard is it to move over to another? But you'll see this develop further. You'll see Daimler, you'll see Mercedes-Benz USA involved with this. Uh, because fuel cell technology is very real, it's very, it's really an incredible piece of technology and something that is part of the core competency of Mercedes-Benz. So as you see this develop, it's something that we know is going to be part of the future and the way we're going to do it in the future I think is incredibly innovative in doing it in almost like a hybrid. So you imagine a hybrid today has a gasoline engine and a battery. Imagine a, a fuel cell hybrid would be fuel cell to create the energy and a battery to store it. So it really does make a lot of sense in terms of how you develop that. So something that we're looking forward to when we move in this direction. So again, I mentioned the Daimler way. There's really a place for everything. When we talk about alternative powertrains, this includes obviously diesel engines, gasoline and electric hybrids, diesel hybrids, and pure battery electric. You have to be good. You have to have your toe in the water in all of them. And it's something that, uh, as you see, probably in the next, gosh, probably the next few days, we've actually just made an announcement earlier today how between now and 2018, we'll spend $8 billion on fuel economy technology. This is roughly half of our R&D budget. So you, you understand just how important this is from a company perspective, because every market in the world has certain standards coming. That's the, that's the good thing. It's not just a US thing. It's not just a Germany thing. It's not just a China thing. It's something in some way, shape, or fashion, every market in the world is facing these challenges, and we'll face them in a way together, but in just slightly different flavors. So it should be uh, very interesting in how we develop this. I don't think anyone probably questions the, the future and the most immediate future for zero emission vehicles is battery electrics. And this is something that everybody, I think, is understanding. This is the technology that is here today. Um, it doesn't have some of the same problems that we look for for some of the longer term. Uh, solutions or some of the other alternatives. It doesn't have really the infrastructure in the same way. It doesn't have the infrastructure problem. Everyone has a plug. Well, do they have the right plug? Now that's to be, to be determined, but you can get there. So it doesn't have quite the same infrastructure challenges. And even when you factor in the production of the car and the production of the energy, battery electrics generate roughly half of the gasoline, of the emissions of a gasoline powered car. So we do see that, that that's a big part of our future. Another thing that makes batteries more and more interesting is obviously range and cost are going down. And what we also see is that when you figure out your average trip, nearly 70% of the population would be perfectly fine with a, with a battery electric because their daily round trip is less than 60 miles. So if you think about it, it's, it's one of those where you almost have to do the math yourself sometimes. We all think we drive way more than that. I, I would think, gosh, in a day I probably drive you know, 40, 50, 60 miles, or maybe even more. And you'd be shocked by how little you drive in certain instances. It might be 25 miles, 30 miles. But that range level and that range anxiety that goes along with it, we're being it, we're able to stretch that more and more as the technology comes forward. So we've seen battery technology develop so much more quickly because so many people are getting involved with it. We've seen, and one of the most important factors is obviously this is driving the cost down. So what we see is since 2010, the cost of battery technology has gone down nearly 65%. So that's a big thing. Obviously, we think that's going to advance further. We see the costs have to go down even further because we've really got to drive that technology. And we see that the range can add to that. So we need longer range, lower cost. That's really a, a big part of the future in terms of battery electric. So a big part of what we're looking to do, and uh, we see a huge part of that as our growth. We see by 2040, this could represent, a, I think, a minimum of a quarter of the cars on the road. This could happen even sooner. It's really an interesting piece. We see 2040, but as the technology gets adopted, this is something that you almost have to prepare for this, possibly happening 10 years, 15 years sooner. So an interesting thing as this is developing, and obviously the sales are going up, and we project them at a pretty high rate by this 2040 time frame. One of the things that's helping this, obviously, one of the things when in DeepMars presentation, we understand that how younger people, again, I mentioned it earlier, accepting of new technologies. And we see this in a very strong way, especially with millennials. They've grown up with plug-in hybrids. They've grown up with hybrid technology, battery electric vehicles. It's not something new for them, and they're very accepting of them. What we see from millennials is nearly 60% accept and consider a, a normal hybrid. They would absolutely do that. They were, they're also willing to pay for it. Traditional hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and 34%, roughly a third of the population is embracing electric vehicles. So that tells you right there, once millennials are of age, let's say, in that prime earning years, 
uh, buying cars, things like that, that you're right there uh, in terms of what you expect the penetration for battery electric vehicles. So obviously a, a big part of the portfolio will be there. Another core competency, and this is something we've developed, and this is uh, more so in large trucks, but compressed natural gas. A lot of people ask about compressed natural gas or liquid natural gas, and this is something obviously from a U.S. perspective very plentiful and, and probably very interesting, especially here in the U.S., and we're developing our core competency there in large trucks and buses. Uh, so in other parts of the world, we have cars and trucks uh, running on compressed natural gas every day. So again, another core competency because what we're learning is that all of these technologies are not individual from each other. Each one, you actually learn something about the other. Compressed natural gas, we actually use to learn a lot about hydrogen storage and fuel cells. So there's things that you can do from your battery electric cars that teach you something about you, what you might do in a plug-in hybrid. So there's really some interesting sort of cross-pollinization as you develop one scenario, you're able to use some of that technology in some other cars. So definitely big pieces of it. So what we see though, obviously is some of the same roadblocks. Uh, infrastructure, limited model offering, uh, the, the compressed natural, the natural gas market is relatively volatile, and you also, the offshoot of getting a natural gas out of the earth is methane. So that's something that's 25 more, 25% uh, more volatile than CO2, so it's not a, it's not always the best way to go about it. So you always have to think about the full circle of how you get the energy, and when you bring that up, uh, you do have some, some uh, other pieces to consider. So. That's part of it, but all of these things really come together and, it, and what we consider is this road ahead is not one that is defined by one technology. You really are considering what we will consider, we're still, we invented diesel technology, we'll be continuing with it, we see that it has a really, few, a really very strong future, especially for long haul over the road. This is a technology that's proven and we see that it has uh, great potential still. Fuel cell technology, we're excited about our next generation fuel cell car. Uh, I mentioned that this will be an interesting hybrid and, and really, a, I think, the next step in what you'll see uh, for the real future. Battery electric, a big part of the future is even now, but we see this going further in terms of driving down costs, faster charging, as well as longer range. We'll also see when it comes to charging, something we're excited about with the next generation S class is wireless charging. So wireless charging is something interesting. We talked about it in the E-Class where you can take your phone and wireless charge it in the cup holder. Uh, but the ability to bring wireless charging to the road is, is a game changer. Just imagine the time that you, you spend or looking for a plug, or why not just drive in your garage, park over your charger, and anytime you're in the garage, you're charging. So all these things will make things more convenient. And I'd be willing to bet 10 years from now, we'll think about plugging in a car like, well, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Why would I do that? Wireless charging will be where everything goes in that direction. So a big thing happening there. CNG, LNG, and also hybrids. Hybrids are really that bridge, plug-in hybrids especially. Uh, we'll, uh, you'll see a lot of those coming in the future. Uh, we've got two on the road today in the U.S. market. We'll have a third before the end of the year. You'll see multiple offerings there because this is the car that really bridges the gap when you need the longer range of, of a internal combustion engine, but you're able to also drive electric. We'll see the range on these cars stretch out to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles over time. And with that, you really have that perfect combination and the car that really bridges to getting to that full zero emission vehicle, be that battery electric, fuel cell technology, or any combination of the technologies that we have uh, planning going forward. So, that just gives you a little bit of a picture. Obviously, we see that you don't place your, uh, your eggs all in one basket. There's a lot of technology out there, and our goal is to be at the forefront in every step of the way.